let me introduce our speakers. Charles Abo Purcelli is an artist, photographer, and author. Her work reflects her passion for preserving architecture, history, and the environment. With a pet hoc for photo photography with the most unnoticed and forgotten, her images and words have been published as photo essay books, fine art prints, magazines, online, and many professional venues. In several cases, her images are all that remain of some of the historically and architecturally relevant places she's documented. David Mack Hardiman is the author of several books and articles regarding the history of people who had disabilities. He has a 45-year career in human services, retiring as an associate vice president at People, Inc. in Buffalo. He's been instrumental in the restoration of several abandoned institutional cemeteries throughout western New York, including Craig Colony. All right, it's a pleasure to be with you, so many people here today. Thank you for the invitation to come and speak about Craig Colony. Uh, Shar and I worked diligently to put together that publication, which will be in the back. And uh, I want to tell you a little bit about my connection to Craig Colony. When I was a student at Geneseo a long, long, long time ago when I had long hair and I was a hippie, uh, I went to Craig Colony to visit once. Then in the early 1980s, I worked for the Western New York DDSO. So some of you probably worked for the DDSO, those of you who worked at Craig Colony. And I worked at their summer camp, which is in uh, Angola, New York. So. People from Craig Colony made the journey over to Angola for camp for a week. I don't know if any of you are familiar with that, but uh, each DDSO would take a separate week to send people to us. And uh, it was a wonderful place right on the shores of Lake Erie. I remember a young gentleman who came from Craig Colony, and when he came to us, uh, there wasn't a lot of time because it was late in the afternoon. We were getting ready for dinner, so I didn't have a lot of information about the people I was working with. I just knew their names. It was important to know what their name was anyway. And so we started communicating. He started communicating with me in gestures. In other words, he'd point to things that he wanted, and then I'd point back, and we'd point around, and we began to have our own little communication system. And uh, the presumption was that he was not verbal, obviously. And he, he used a wheelchair to get around. And fortunately, back then, we actually had a cabin that could accommodate people who used wheelchairs. A lot of the world at that point was not accessible at all to people who had wheelchairs and walkers. It was very difficult to get around anywhere in the community. But we had a cabin that was designed for, for people who use uh, adaptive equipment. Uh, I asked about transferring him, and he would point to me. So I began to transfer him into the wheelchair when he needed to get in, transfer him out of the wheelchair when he needed to get out. And then he, uh, on a day or two into his stay at camp, he pointed to my back. So he wanted a ride on my back. And I was like, well, this is going a little far, but okay, go ahead. You know, he wasn't a big person or anything, so I could give him a, a piggyback ride here and there throughout his week at camp. When the staff came to get him uh, on the last day of camp, he was still in the cabin, and uh, they nonchalantly gave him some directions like get in your chair and head out. And to my amazement, he did like some reverse pirouette into the wheelchair, put his seatbelt on, and then wheeled himself out. <laughs> and I was like, Wow, what a week-long vacation he had. On his way out, he turned to the side and said, goodbye, Dave. So I think I was played again. I, I'm not sure. I'm not sure. But it was probably the best damn week he ever had because I, I did, every, did everything that he could do for him. So we're going to talk a little bit about epilepsy now, what epilepsy is and the development of Craig Colony, how it came to be, who were some of the early players in this story, and some of the places involved. Epilepsy are short bursts of uh, synchronized bursts of electrical energy in your brain. Your brain only weighs three pounds. I remember telling that story at the last uh, 
at the last <laughs> uh, session that we had about that. So it's three pounds in your head. And it, it, uh, when there's too much electricity, you might have what's called a seizure. You can have a one-time seizure. In other words, you might uh, have a high fever or something, but that doesn't necessarily lead to epilepsy. Epilepsy is more than one, and it can be caused by many different conditions, uh, an infection, uh, some injury to the brain, et cetera, disease process. So that's what uh, epilepsy is. Prior to the development of Craig Colony, people who had epilepsy and other disorders were kept in what's called almshouses or poor houses, uh, which were kind of notorious places. Each county in uh, New York State had a poor house or two. Uh, and we've, uh, over, over the years, I've done a lot of work with the poor house, uh, trying to remember that people live there and who were they and uh, again, working in the abandoned cemeteries. So that's what epilepsy is. And again, there wasn't a lot of places for people to go that were decent at the time. Uh, those are, that's a basket. So we're gonna talk a little bit about the Shakers now. The Shakers were uh, a religious group that uh, was, were very productive, uh, except for reproduction of the species. So they produced a lot of baskets and barrels and brooms and all these wonderful things. And they had this beautiful piece of property uh, in Saunier where they uh, farmed, they had uh, tree, fruit trees there, they had berries, they had herb gardens. It was a beautiful, beautiful place. Because they did not re reproduce, they were looking for recruits, obviously, and they would often recruit orphans. And so they were kind of competing with the state of New York, who was also taking in orphans into places like Craig Colony sometimes. So their numbers dropped as time went on, and eventually they uh, wanted to sell the property. Uh, so they had that beautiful piece of property, which became Craig Colony. Uh, we did learn at the last session that there are no more Shakers. There were two left a, a few years ago, but they've all gone on to their reward. So there's no one left in the Shaker colonies anywhere, apparently. There she is. That's Ida Saxton when she was a young lady. Uh, Ida Saxton was a young, uh, beautiful, fashionable person from Ohio who, uh, who had uh, a, a, a rather prestigious upbringing. Her father was a banker and she was sent to finishing school. She went on a tour of Europe uh, after she graduated. And when she returned, uh, her father would leave her in charge of the bank on occasion, which was uh, quite unusual for the time for a woman to be in that sort of position of business. Ida Saxton married William McKinley, who became president of the United States. Uh, and she had kind of a tragic life. Uh, both of her daughters died before they came to the presidency. And she would sit with her daughter's uh, empty rocking chair next to her. She was, uh, I liken her to a mourning dove in a gilded cage. She was very much on display, but she had a lot of issues. And sometimes uh, those issues resulted in what looked like seizures. So that's how she's influential in this story. The president was very devoted to her, and she's the first person really who had reasonable accommodations in the United States. She was allowed to sit at the White House instead of standing to greet people, and they took a great deal of care for her um, because they didn't know whenever she was going to have a, a seizure or some sort of uh, issue. Uh, it's a mysterious story because she uh, worried a great deal, according to her friends and family, about the president being assassinated. And they came to Buffalo in 1901 to the Pan Am Exposition and her husband was assassinated. Uh, and after that, it is said that she never had another seizure. So it's a strange story that we'll probably never have the answers to, but I like strange stories that we never have the answer to because you can 
put all these kind of theories into it. Uh, she lived about six more years after the president uh, died in Buffalo. Sir? Yes? Did she have anything to do with Craig? She's the inspiration for uh, an institution in Ohio which led to the one at Craig. So she didn't, she wasn't directly involved, she was the inspiration. Uh, President, or well, go, then Governor McKinley opened the uh, institution in Ohio, which was for people with epilepsy. So that's Gallipoli, so that's in Ohio. Gallipoli was the precursor to Craig. So it was the, uh, the colony, uh, a colony system which had smaller cottages. Prior to this, in almshouses and other institutions for people who had disabilities or mental illness, they were in large uh, asylums, essentially is what they were called, asylums. And uh, the, the colony at Gallipoli was modeled on a colony in Germany called Bethel. So they, some Americans learned about Bethel, went there, saw what it was like, and the, uh, the main focus was to have smaller cottage-like settings so that people uh, were not, uh, you know, hoarded together in mass as they were in institutions. Gallipoli, they did a lot of work on uh, recreation. They had a lot of teams and sports at Gallipoli, which was a, a, an improvement from the prior conditions. And uh, they believed in proper chewing because they... The theory at the time was that people, if they didn't chew enough, uh, they might have a seizure. So I'm always like a half an hour behind my wife as far as eating at the table because I've, I've learned that you're supposed to chew. <laughs> I don't know what that had to do with anything, but they, they wanted people to chew. <laughs> that is William Pryor Letchworth. So he had a lot to do with Craig Colony. He was a very successful businessman in Buffalo, uh, made his money in iron and saddlery. Uh, and his uh, summer home was the Glen Iris. Imagine if that was your summer home, or imagine if that was your only home, first of all. <laughs> but that was his summer home. Uh, William Pryor Letchworth was a Quaker, and he, he believed in helping people who were less fortunate he did a lot of work with people who had disabilities, and he went to a lot of the asylums and poor houses where these people were being kept. He went to Europe and toured the facilities there on his own dime. He paid for it all himself and studied the uh, new treatments for people with epilepsy and brought them back to the United States. And again, this was all volunteer. He didn't have to do any of this. He wasn't employed in this uh, field necessarily, uh, but he got wind that the Quaker colony was going to go up for sale, so he talked to the people in New York State uh, government about purchasing that property. So he lived on one side of Mount Morris, and Craig Colony obviously was on the other side. Uh, and then he donated his estate, uh, which became Letchworth State Park. Right. Again, it's uh, a story of great uh, philanthropy in, in regard to Mr. Letchworth, and he had a lot to do with uh, people who were less fortunate. He also knew Dorothea Dix, who was a social worker who helped a lot of people in institutions throughout the United States, and he was very much an advocate for children as well, too, that children should be kept separate from adults in these facilities and should be taught separately uh, their skills, etc. There's an aerial view of Craig County. As you can see, it's, you know, the, the uh, property is divided by Keshequa Creek there. And these are just a few shots of buildings, which some of you may recognize, right? I'm hearing people talking, so I assume you're recognizing. Uh, that looks like the uh, ivy has taken over that one. Uh, some of them are some of their, them are in okay shape, some are not, obviously. Oops. And there's a trunk, all right? So that has to do with uh, the belongings that people who have disabilities had in uh, 
in institutions in uh, New York. So uh, there was a person who was at Craig who died in a fire, and uh, he died in the attic of uh, the building in which he lived. And it was said that he was getting things from his trunk. After they sounded the alarm, he went back into the building and unfortunately died when he was trying to recover his belongings, uh, probably because the building was on fire and he wanted to get his stuff. But in one article, only one article of about 11 that I read about the fire, the, uh, they indicated that maybe he had something to do with starting the fire, even though all the other articles contradicted that and said he got dressed when everybody else did and went outside. So it was kind of like a, a controversial uh, victim shaming, if you will, because he's the person who died. Trunks, belongings, suitcases. This reminds me of a book that a friend of mine wrote uh, called Suitcases from the Attic. Yeah, su su uh, from about the state hospital in Willard, which is uh, over on Seneca Lake. If you get a chance to read that book, it will probably will change your perspective on all of this because it's, it's about the belongings that people had which they found in an attic at Willard when they were closing it down in 1995. They went up into an attic, discovered more than 400 suitcases and trunks like that, took them to Albany, and then two years later, someone said, do you think we should open those? That kind of demonstrates what happens in Albany. No. I'll leave politics. <laughs> oh my God, applause. <laughs> so... They opened them, and inside were the belongings that people had taken on their last ride, their last ride to Willard, where they died. And it's amazing to see what they took, photographs, mementos of their lost children, things that were important to them, but they were kept in the attic, not down where they lived. So it was almost like their belongings were taken hostage. If you ever get a chance to see that exhibit, it does come around, and the book is by my friend Darby Penny, who passed away a few years ago, and Peter Stosny, uh, Suitcases from the Attic, if you ever get to look at it. Because they did photograph every single item that belonged to each person, and uh, it's a great story. Yes? Were the items ever reunited with the families of those patients? That's a great question. They're still trying to do that. You have, to, you have to know who, who the descendants are, and many of these people lived a long time ago, and it's not easy to get their names. All right, so there, there are postcards from Craig. We were, uh, we were fortunate enough to meet with uh, Karen Roff, whose friend Tom had this whole treasure trove of items from Craig Colony, and she uh, allowed us to look at them and photograph them at the same time. Here's uh, Field Day. Okay, this, you know, this is one example of events that they might have had at uh, Field Day, sometimes around the 4th of July and things. And you can see that they had a, a peanut pickup. I'm not sure what that is. It sounds hard to do, peanut pickup. Three-legged race, uh, rescue race, and a pie-eating contest. Okay, that sounds good. I don't know. There's also the duck dash, Cayuga duck dash. I wonder what that looked like. I don't know. Uh, there's some other examples of uh, activities that went on. And I have to say, Craig Colony was uh, extremely uh, devoted to activities. There were a lot of things for people to do, and that was a new approach to people living in institutions, is to have things to do. It's called occupational therapy, having something to do, having a meaningful role in society. Many of the uh, people who lived there also in the beginning worked there, so they were also employed uh, performing tasks for others. I, I met with a gentleman who lived there, and uh, he would feed the children. He said, I didn't have any training or anything. I would just go in and spoon feed them through the slats of the adult cribs. All of that would be frowned upon today. That would be not good, but he, he felt as though he had a meaningful role, if that makes sense. So there was a, there's a great deal of occupational therapy there.
Here's some things. There's a barbecue in 1907. Uh, those are a lot of potions, <laughs> potions to make people feel better. Epilepsy is sometimes treated with different types of medication, et cetera, uh, and they were, there, there was a lot of it, and some of them were bromides. Uh, there's the labels for medication, label maker, labels for medication, and there was a morgue, so there was a... Uh, many people at Craig Colony did pass away, unfortunately, and uh, that's where many of them are. Uh, about 2,000, more than 2,000 are buried in uh, the cemetery on Moyer Road, which is where I spent a lot of time because uh, we were cleaning the stones, each individual stone. It took about uh, a half an hour for one stone, and there were more than 2,000 of them. Uh, they were black and gray with uh, different types of mold and mildew and everything else. So it took us a long time to clean. The uh, people at the correctional facility were very cooperative with that project and helped us out. They brought us water and things because it's essentially not functioning anymore. So we needed some supplies to uh, help us get that done. And that, again, it took a long time, but I had all these wonderful volunteers who would come out uh, when they could on days like this where the temperature is uh, pretty hot. So uh, I don't know, it was just random. I picked days and it was always hot. It wasn't, but they were very devoted to that. We in, in total uh, have tended to about 6,000 graves throughout Western New York, including Gowanda, the Niagara County Almshouse, uh, the two cemeteries in Gowanda, one in uh, Perrysburg, and the cemetery in Craig Colony. Yes? Were there any identifications on those stones? Amazingly, those stones have names on them, only names. Uh, there are no dates on them, but they do have names. In the other, in the other institutional cemeteries in which I worked, they were just numbers. So trying to find out who was who is like this mad, uh, exercise in, in uh, constant futility and door slamming <laughs> in your face, like trying to find out who was who. But I was able to do it for a few families uh, because they got a copy of the death record from the town in which the asylum was located. The death record said what number grave they were in. And then in Gowanda, they were separated by religion. So there was a cross for people who were Catholic a wreath for people who were Protestant, and the Star of David for people who were Jewish. So we, by matching the, de the uh, number to the religion, to the right section of the cemetery, I was able to take some family members there for the first time to see it. It's not easy to experience that, even though I would tell them what they were going to see. The reality when you see a number is just, it's hard to fathom. If you want to know more about institutions, the, for, many, for many of the institutions, this is all that's left is the cemeteries because so many of them have been abandoned, torn down, or became prisons, so you can't visit. Uh, but uh, that's one place where you can see what it was like, uh, how people were treated. All right, I'm gonna turn this over to Shar, my friend. Thank you for coming, everybody. Um, it's nice to know that this many people still care about this kind of history. Um, I'm a lot louder than Dave, but if anybody else has a problem hearing me in the back, I can be louder. Um, you can get louder. <laughs> one of my charms. Um, I often use photography as a way of preserving history. Um, I, I'm an exhibiting artist, I show in galleries, but that isn't as important to me as getting some of my photographic work out that acts as preservation. So I'm glad everybody came to this to share their interest in, in what we did here. Um, as Jim had said in his introduction, some of my images are all that's left of a lot of historically relevant buildings and structures and institutions. Um, I get in however I can, and I hope that karma watches over me and realizes that, you know, although I'm taking chances, that I think the story is important enough to tell of the people who lived in places like this. Um, I 
had to be escorted around the prison. Uh, I'm the only photographer, they say, that will ever be allowed in there to do this. It caused quite a ruckus, me being there. Um, my good friend Bob Gillen was the CO that uh, got to show me around for the day. And a lot of the other CEOs weren't real happy with that because he got to spend the day showing a lady photographer around while they were all working. Um, but thank goodness he did. Very knowledgeable man. Um, we were allowed to get into a lot of the buildings that um, other than people who work there are not allowed to see anymore because it is a state prison. It's medium security. But as the inmates were walking around the grounds, even though there's COs all over the place, they call it groovy land. It's very relaxed. It's like walking around on a college campus. Everyone is greeting one another. They were asking why we were there. We couldn't spend so much time explaining why because we only had Bob's eight hour shift to try to get this done. Sadly, a lot of the buildings are marked for demolition. This is the Catholic church. There were other churches on the, the campus as well. The place is absolutely massive, as many of you know. Um, it was built on 1,900 acres. And like I said, sadly, a lot of the buildings are going to be lost to demolition, but they're also investing a lot of money into refurbishing a lot of the buildings for reuse, um, including uh, several of the hospitals, uh, the morgue, uh, not that they're using the morgue, but there were still cabinets and stuff down there that were reminiscent of what it was when the epileptic colony was running. Um, I'm very bad at public speaking, so I have to keep referring to my notes. Um, most, oh, I wanted to show the photo. Um, it was a little intimidating walking around something that looked like this to start with. We had a lot of slamming gates behind us, in front of us. We had a empty pockets. My husband went along with me that day. Um, very intimidating and unsettling at first, but once I started getting into what the buildings were and as Bob was explaining to me what they were, I just started putting myself back into that time, what it must have been like to live there as a patient, uh, as someone who was being treated with a disease or a condition that wasn't always totally understood in the early going. Um, oh, let's see, where did... Uh, most of the buildings, are, like I said, have been renovated or are, but several were marked for demolition. Uh, this is uh, one of the few remaining shaker buildings left on the property. I understand this was converted into a bowling alley. It was a shaker brew making factory at the time, um, but they kept it pretty much as it was and just made it a recreational center for the patients. As Dave said, they really focused on activities and stimulation for the patients. Um, at, like today, a lot of places where people need health care, people, the staff is overworked, underpaid, not enough employees to go around per patient ratio. So um, anyway, we went back out um, to try to cover more ground and this map gives you an idea not only of that aerial view that Dave had showed you, but this map also identifies, there's a key that goes with it. Nancy will have maps available, this as well as the key as to where all the buildings were and the name of the buildings. And like Dave had said, the residences were set up on one side of the creek for men and one side of the creek for women. Like I said, the place was so huge. Um, they, they had their own, it, it was like a city. I mean, not only did they have hospitals, they had nursing schools, a pharmacy, a general store, training schools, a brick factory, a huge laundry building, which was my absolute favorite for some reason, and even its own power station and post office. So it was really this huge self-sustaining community. We went inside a lot of the abandoned buildings off of the grounds of the prison, and this was inside one of the old farmhouses. And they're really, really in bad shape. But what I found extremely interesting is that some of the patients were actually allowed to live in these farmhouses under supervision to get out and work the fields. They either took care of livestock, they raised crops, um, whatever they could do manually, physically, because that was part of the belief of helping cure epilepsy. Is some fresh air and exercise would help strengthen the body and hopefully reduce the effects of epilepsy on the body. Um, this one is called the Catalpa Farmhouse. If anybody 
ever had gotten out that way. They all have different names. Um, most of the buildings were named after flowers and trees. The residence where the women stayed were named after flowers and the buildings where the men stayed were named after trees. There was just so much material that we started gathering once we got people to start talking to us that we didn't know how we were gonna possibly put this book together where it made sense to anybody. So we decided to put it together as we came across the material. We wanted to make it look like an old journal that someone had gathered postcards, uh, samples of sewing, uh, whatever it was, and we created two main characters in the book so they could tell both sides of the story. We wanted to present the layperson's view, so we created the character of a groundskeeper who kind of saw and told everything that was going on behind the scenes, and we created the character of a doctor who was looking at it from purely a medical standpoint, which we as lay people don't always understand. We may think it's cruel, we may think we're using humans as guinea pigs, but they did the best they could at the time. But everything in these diaries that we put in the book are based on absolute fact, whether it's scientific fact, whether it's documentation from people's records or their experiences, everything we told through the fictional characters is true. So we call it creative nonfiction. We took a little liberties, but everything in there is fact. Um, Dave and I are, are, are very, very fortunate and grateful to have had this experience. So we wanted to share our stories with people through this book. We were greatly moved by the conditions that <clears throat> some of the people lived in at the colony. Some lived in wonderfully beautiful cottages. You could tell they were more money people. Some lived in more of an apartment style uh, living conditions. Others lived and worked at the farmhouses. I, I don't recall the name of this farmhouse. Um, oh, I'm sorry, this is the Clover. Um, and some were even kept in what were locked wards. This is called cottage number 12. And these were the more severe patients, the um, poorer patients were kept in you know, buildings like this. And like I said, we couldn't help but be moved by the experiences that we've had researching for this book. We wanted to put it in publication and share it with everyone. And speaking of stories, we know there are a lot more to be told by you folks here, by people you may know, and Nancy has developed an opportunity for you folks to be able to tell your stories if you would like to, and she can tell you more about that.